evening. So if you've been to my events before, you know how I like to do this. Good evening! That is more like it. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Eastside Housing Forum. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, anyone here use their cell phones for social media? Anyone here like to tweet? So I see one, one tweeter in the background, so we like to use the hashtag Rent Freeze or Housing Forum, and I'm at Ben Kalos. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center for hosting us tonight. Uh, the Neighborhood Center is a great resource for our whole community, and if you aren't familiar with the program, you should pick up some materials on your way out. I want to uh, thank uh, Greg Morris, the Executive Director, uh, Paki Kane, as well as Crystal Simmons for their support on this event. Uh, we are uh, working to upgrade the kitchen, which is underway, and as such, uh, we've actually we've provided the funding, but as such, we apologize. The space is tighter than usual. You usually can hold twice as many people, and uh, the attendance is quite amazing for this year's event. Uh, tonight's event is to arm you with knowledge and resources to know your rights uh, when you're looking for housing, re-signing your lease, and everything in between with your landlord. And it's also to arm you with the knowledge of how to make a difference for all New Yorkers, to connect you with advocates to rally for rent laws, a rent freeze at the Rent Guidelines Board. And over the past four years, we've won two historic low rent increases and two rent freezes for rent stabilized ten uh, tenants. Yes. So the good news is if you're here, you're part of a movement and that movement is getting results. And we're here tonight to continue that work into my second term. And uh, if you're here, you also know how much of a challenge housing is. Uh, like so many, maybe your rent has gone up while your wages have remained stagnant. Maybe your apartment has fallen into disrepair as your landlord has tried to kick you out and raise your rents. Maybe you've been surprised one day to find that your rent has jumped because of a major capital improvement or an individual apartment increase or because you're no longer receiving a preferential rent. These are all big words, big uh, terms that no one should have to learn, and uh, it's, it's a problem. Uh, we'll address some of, the, uh, some of the programs we have here in the city to help pay your rent, as well as how you can get involved in the fight for better rent laws in Albany to freeze stabilized rent citywide at this year's Rent Guidelines Board. Uh, before we dive in, we have our champion in Albany, in the State Senate. Uh, she, uh, she has been fighting for our community ever since she's been elected, uh, which is more than a decade ago. Uh, last year, when they wanted to allow for buildings of unlimited height and unlimited density, she single-handedly stopped that from happening, and we owe her a huge debt of gratitude. You can join me in welcoming the state Thank you. occasional wins, like stopping them from having super talls wherever they want with no community participation. But the truth is, every issue you're working on here tonight, every group that is here to speak to you outside and to speak to you in, in front of the microphone, all know what we know and you need to know. We need Albany to do a much better job on behalf of tenants and affordable housing. Because everything we try to do here, everything the city council, the mayor, the rank guidelines board, the advocates try to do here, ends up being trying to just play whack-a-mole with things that are going on because they're legal, and they're too often legal because of what Albany fails to do in passing the right laws for tenants. 
So this week alone, the New York Times, I believe, did a four-part series about things that are going wrong for tenants throughout the housing world in New York City. Rent regulation, harassment, failure to deliver on fundamental obligations of landlords for correct tenancy, corruption, corruption, and more corruption. <laughs> We need better laws come in Albany. We have better laws drafted. We have better laws drafted that I watched get passed by the assembly, controlled by us Democrats mostly from New York City. They pass them every year. And I sit in the New York State Senate, which has been controlled with a couple of exceptions by conservative Republicans from outside New York City for almost every year since 1939. And we see real estate for more and more of their lobbying money and campaign dollars into the campaign funds of Republicans who don't represent New York City. In fact, I would argue sometimes are carrying anti-tenant bills that talk about multifamily dwellings. And I go, you don't even have a multifamily dwelling in your district. I'm not even sure you have an elevator building building in your district, and you're carrying laws to do harm to the people here in New York City. And you're refusing to let the important bills become law for the people here in New York City. Now, the good news is, technically, we actually have the majority in the New York State Senate, the Democrats. We have one left, Cynthia Felder, who says, He's sticking with the Republicans and won't give us his vote. Ooh. But, thank you, Ben. But, I'm feeling a blue wave. I'm a little partisan here. I think I can pull that off in East Harlem. Um, so, I'm feeling a bit partisan. A blue wave coming through. We are going to have more Democrats take seats from Republicans in November. We are going to have very much. This is a not-for-profit building here. Um, government event. But on your, on your spare time outside of this building, there's all kinds of things you can do. And when we have a Democratic Senate in January 2019, I am feeling more optimistic than I have ever felt since I joined the New York State Senate that we will actually be able to deliver on the kinds of bills we need, including bills to do away with vacancy deep control. Bills that will allow, that will protect you from a preferential rent skyrocketing. Bills that will ensure that harassment cannot be a basis for evicting you. More protections in housing court. More fair and equitable treatment of the remainder of the rent control departments in a world where if you live in rent regulated housing, you go got to fight with the rent guidelines board every year. And if you're in rent controlled housing, you're going seven and a half percent every year, year in, year out, housing benefits, plus the password, thank you. <coughs> so I'm just going to get to that part of the sentence. So there are so many things we must do in Albany. We need your help. I have great colleagues in city government, and I have some great <coughs> colleagues in Albany, but I just need enough of them for Andres to her cousins to be the leader of the Senate and decide what bills come to the floor for votes, because I am very confident that we are going to be able to pass critical bills next year. In fact, a large number of tenant advocates came up to Albany just two days ago and met with the Senate Democrats, and we talked about our plan for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, for hosting <coughs> year doing this together and uh, before we ever did this event every single May as part of the lead up to the Rank Island Court vote in June, uh, Senator Kruger was leading the East Side Housing uh, meetings year after year and so it's just been a pleasure to work in partnership uh, with her office. Uh, ten years ago, 
I worked with a uh, young man, we were both young men, we're still young men, it's hard to believe that uh, anyone could know each other for 10 years and be working with each other for 10 years, but both of us wanted to work with Senator Liz Kruger to clean things up. Thankfully, we were able to work with the Democratic Assembly member for the East Side, Assemblyman Jonathan Bing. Uh, he was the chair of the subcommittee on Mitchell Lama. We have a lot of Mitchell Lamas, especially in this part of the neighborhood, which we are fighting to preserve. Some of them have been preserved to this day because of those efforts, and we continue those fights every day. And uh, it, last year, uh, Mr. Powers was uh, was running, and uh, I didn't think that there could be anyone better to serve our neighborhood. He grew up in uh, Stuyvesant Town, and uh, he, he still lives in Stuyvesant Town, and he, he's part of us, and uh, I know that he is going to fight with us against the real estate interests and the landlords to keep you safe and in your homes. Please join me in welcoming my colleague on the east side. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. And Ben was, Ben is right. It's been 10 years and uh, I am very happy to be on the city council, but I'm very happy to have a colleague like Councilman Kalos who gets it. He understands what, uh, not only how to organize events like tonight to make sure that people know the rights, how to organize, what's going on, what is going on in our community, how we can make sure that when we are tackling issues like housing and development, but he gets it because just like me, he grew up here, he has a real life experience in this neighborhood, uh, looking at the changing character of the neighborhood, wondering why buildings are going to the sky, wondering why I'm going to be the one to say the rent is too damn high, and, uh, and wondering what we can do about it. Um, so I am very thankful for you for helping to put this event together, but also for helping me as I got to get here and helping me along the way. And I have to say, Liz Kruger is not giving herself enough credit. There is nobody in Albany, since she's been there, who has been a stronger fighter for, for things like rent regulation, for affordable housing, for making sure the development does not overbear our neighborhoods. Um, we are going to be lucky because I feel very confident in January Liz Cougar is going to be part of a majority in the state senate and we can start making sense at a very nonsensical housing laws in New York State and that will make sure that when we're doing the fights and we're going to Albany that we have people that we can look at that actually get it too and can say to us, you're right, we need to look at things like preferential rent and major capital improvements and rent control and, and skyrocketing costs. So um, just give them one more round of applause. <laughs> so, uh, I will keep it short. You don't want to hear me talk too long, but I will just say, I really got my start in politics. Hey, well, actually working for Liz Kruger, but, um, but also doing tenant organizing in my neighborhood, Stice in town, Peter Cooper. Uh, one of the sad tragedies of my life was having to quit my tenants association in in town to become a city council member. So I'm not that upset about it, but I am. But I certainly got empowered through the work I did, talking to my neighbors every single day and working together to figure out how to work through these different problems and understand that service, even when there's things that we feel like we can't control because the laws don't work for us or there are market pressures out there, how to be creative. How to look for new ideas and new ways to organize. So that even when it, and everybody thinks our back's up against the wall, how do we use the resources, how do we use our own intelligence to do better? But the good news here is I think in the city council in Albany, a change is coming. I think there will be a more pro-tenant uh, uh, legislators and advocates in, the, in, in both the city council and the, and the state legislature in the years to come. So, there's a rent guidelines board vote coming up. If you care about rent regulation, please go testify, be part of that effort. There are certainly an end of session in Albany. Politics are, are, are wild in Albany right now. Um, certainly at the city council, we are doing ongoing hearings about affordability, about development, about land use, about character of our neighborhoods. Please come and show up and testify so people like Ben and I can point right to our own constituents and say, these are the stories that you aren't hearing. We have one of two, we have two of 51, and we really, it's really helpful and powerful when we have real New Yorkers show up and talk to us about, at the city council, about the real life issues about skyrocketing rents and housing and things, to take those New York Times articles that we read and put a human face to them. So there's a lot to do. I know I'll be down there at the Rent Guidelines Board advocating for a rent freeze again. We deserve it. 
And uh, I know that Councilman Kalos and Sable and some of those who can also be there. We would really ask you to be part of that next couple of months. And as we move forward into elections, campaigns, and the next, hopefully, session in Albany, we can make the politics work better in Albany, make sure that we're doing our jobs here as well. And I would really ask you, if you have the time and energy, to be part of that and to get uh, more involved in the effort. So thank you again. Thank, first of all, thank you for being here and participating in this. And make sure you talk to your own neighbors about what you, you hear today and be a resource for your own buildings and your own community. But thank you to Council Member Kales. Thank you to State Senator Liz Kruger. All that thank you for, for, for having me. And I will uh, look forward to uh, seeing the rest of us. Thank you so much. Let's hear it for Council Member Keith Powers and our State Senator Liz Kruger. I think that this will get bigger next year. I think uh, I'm going to invite my council member on the other part of the east side uh, to be a co-host for next year. We'll hold it even in an even bigger venue to hold okay. more hundreds of folks. Uh, and I just want to echo the thank you to all of you for coming out. There are a million things you could be doing in New York City right now, but you coming out to arm yourselves is incredibly important. I want to take a moment to thank uh, folks, so as you may have heard, Keith and I started off as staff. It turns out elected officials don't do it all ourselves. So I, I want to thank from my staff, uh, she just started uh, two weeks ago, uh, Abby Damsky, who is our new special events person. If we can thank her, Abby, raise your hand. Uh, also, uh, Senator Kruger has a, a housing person who has been a housing person for, I believe, 10 years. I believe we've more, more than 10 years. With me. Sixteen years. Sarah Hellster. Yeah. Uh, we have Jenna Klaus from Keith Powers' office. Uh, and uh, what do you call it? I'm going to invite up Rebecca Graham from uh, Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright's office for some quick remarks. <coughs> to meet you all and to hear all of your concerns. We look forward to seeing you in Albany. Um, Assembly Member C. Ray is sorry that she was unable to attend, but she's at a family event today. And um, I work very closely with Senator Kruger's staff. In fact, I was on the phone with them this afternoon working on amendments to bills. And um, I encourage you all to visit us in Albany and come by and we will advocate for you. Uh, the Albany office number is 518-455-5676. Thank you. Good Albany number is 518-455-5676. And I, you can call the Albany office and they will transfer you to the city office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you to our elected officials and staffs. And if, is there another, any other staff and elected officials that I may have missed? I want to take a moment to recognize that this event was also co-hosted by our Congress member, Carolyn Maloney, our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, and I assure you she will be here tonight. Also, our State Senator, Jose Serrano, uh, Assembly Member, Dan Port. Uh, we have a new Assembly Member. His name is Harvey Epstein. Uh, he used to be at an organization called the Urban Justice Center. He was actually the one who said we should start doing this event uh, five years ago or maybe four years ago, and so that is one of the reasons he is sponsoring. We hope that you'll hopefully get a chance to stop by. So, um, quick quick uh, explanation on format. So this is being recorded, so if you have any questions, that will be recorded. The camera's right over there, so the speakers will generally get it. Your voice may be heard if you're sharing information. It's gonna be online, on the internet, on YouTube later. 
you'll be able to share it with friends and neighbors who didn't make it tonight. Uh, and so the format is we're going to be inviting multiple partners up to come and talk to you about different uh, opportunities. And uh, no one will be offended if you leave early. It's going to be, uh, oh, oh, it's going to be, uh, it won't be that long, but uh, folks will be coming up and down. So if you hear a presentation where you, you love it, uh, feel free to follow the speaker out to their table. Folks are here to help you tonight. Uh, if you brought documentation, we're here to help tonight. If you can't be helped tonight, we will schedule an appointment with you, either with the service provider or we have clinics in, I think, all of our offices where we can help. So uh, the run of show is going to be, we're going to hear from Lennox Hill Neighborhood House on um, some of the programming and support that they have. We're going to hear from the Department of Finance on how you can sign up for a senior citizen rent increase exemption or disabled rent increase exemption. We're going to hear from tenants and neighbors about uh, the fight for statewide rent laws and how you can support our state senator in uh, passing this legislation. We're going to hear from Urban Justice, Urban Justice Center. Who here is a rent stabilized tenant? So you're going to hear from uh, Urban Justice Center about what you can do, and I think our, our council member Power spoke a little bit to this, but how you can help fight to keep the rents low. And this is a yearly fight. So if you're a rent stabilized housing and you want to lower your rent, the best thing you can do is fight with us, fight alongside us every year. And then we'll hear from Med Council who will talk to you about testimony prep. So uh, in between those different moments, or if your item isn't coming for a while, you can step out, go into the hallway, come back just as you're coming in and out. Please uh, do your best to be as uh, quiet as possible. And so if you can join me, in welcoming Danielle Brent of the Lennox Hill Neighborhood House to discuss the program. We've got another great neighborhood to here on this side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Danielle Grant. I'm a supervising housing attorney at Lennox Hill Neighborhood House. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to talk to you for a few minutes about some of the programs that we have available to the community. You have a lot of housing users here, so I'm available outside, but I'm not going to get any so it can be great about housing. But our organization has been in the community at East 70th Street, 331 East 70th Street, which is 1st and 2nd Avenue, for 124 years. Um, we have, in terms of housing, we have about 14 housing attorneys at the organization at the moment. We have monthly walk-in legal clinics for the community. Anyone is free to come in and seek um, advice on any sort of housing matter. We also have attorneys that you know provide full representation for any sort of, for, for different kinds of housing um, issues that are in housing court. And, but um, we also spend a lot. We have a lot of resources available, not just for housing, but sort of sort of help get them the services they need to stay in the housing. So we have um, monthly screen clinics to help people apply for and to review whether they're eligible for for screen the senior citizen rent freeze exemption program. We have two senior centers in the community. We have um, a SNAP clinic to help people to enroll in, um, in, in SNAP benefits if they're, if they're eligible with supplemental nutrition assistance program for food stamps. We have um, health insurance enrollment programs available for people in the community if they're interested in enrolling in health care or they want to know if they're eligible for health care. We have end of life planning, advanced directives, programs to help people if they want help you know, preparing to live in will or any sort of other you know, end of life directive that they, they, they need assistance with. So we're available in the community to provide all kinds of support uh, for community members um, to sort of to try and secure social services, um, to help stabilize their housing situation, and to, um, to be sort of a, a center for any sort of seniors in the community who are looking for some sort of uh, community to sort of Join to be a part of it, um, to participate in. So I have flyers out there on the table that have the dates about all of our clinics that we have available. So if there's any sort of housing issue, public assistance issues, free issue, health care issue, we're available in the community to you all to give you advice and to also help you to enroll in the program that you may be eligible for. And we're happy to screen you for any, and any of these programs to help you determine whether you might be eligible. So I think that's about all I'm going to sort of 
And now there are questions, but I just want you to all know that we're here in the community to serve you, to help you. Um, and that's that's all, unless there are questions. Location. What is it? Uh, so, um, so we're at 331 East 70th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. Do you have a table outside? I have a table outside. There, there's a table outside, so you have a question about services and you're close to the 70th Street location. And then uh, from Stanley Isaacs to talk about some of the programs and services they have here. Hi everybody, welcome to Stanley Isaacs Center. How many of you know us? Have been here before? How many are members? Well, if you're not a member and you're over 60, we would love to have you. Um, we provide meals on site every day, five days a week, uh, breakfast and lunch. We have case management programming. We have services. We have fun activities all day. Uh, we have a couple of groups that I run the group with Aaron. We have uh, all sorts of fun things going on every day. Uh, so we'd love to have you over. Come by and say hello. Stop at the desk. Helen's there. She can sign you up. We'll get you a registration appointment. Uh, you can meet with a social worker or a case worker. We'll get to know you, um, and we'll get you involved in the community. Any questions about Stanley Isaacs? Any questions at the desk? Okay. So if you're interested in senior center, yes, please. If you're interested in senior center services, uh, if you know somebody who's hungry or you might be hungry and you're interested in food pantry or uh, snack benefits or, or help with your electric bill or you name it, uh, Lennox Hill and Isaacs are, are here to help, and I just want to thank them for supporting us. Uh, so the next item is uh, folks may hear different types of rent freezes. So the rent freeze that we're usually talking about is uh, at the Rent Guidelines Board, but another rent freeze is a senior citizen rent increase exemption and a disabled resident increase exemption. We have Marcel Dixon from the Department of Finance who will now talk to us a little bit about that. And he has a table, so if you have questions and you want to start filling out the forms tonight, they are here to help. Please join me in welcoming Marcel. Good evening, everyone. Oh, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me here. And I want to thank uh, Councilmember Kellos for having this event. I always think these events are fantastic because uh, we should never keep the knowledge to ourselves. We should disseminate it, you know, be a little bit altruistic with it, so to speak, right? So today I'm going to talk about our rent freeze program. I think predominantly that's what people uh, know it as. That's uh, administered by the Department of Finance and also some other city agencies, HPD. And I'll just quickly say if you live in a um, HPD, um, if you live in a Mitchell Lama development or HDFC development um, you, and you're a senior, you would apply for the senior rent increase exemption program through HPD, okay? Not the Department of Finance. So I'll put the little caveat there up front. All right? So um, I, I, I saw from the, uh, the raise of hands earlier that a lot of individuals here in this room today uh, live in either rent stabilized or rent control departments. So this program might be you know, a huge benefit to you, especially if you qualify and you're able to get your rent freeze and renew over the years, as you know, we would continue to pay the difference, right? So their programs are twofold. So there is a senior citizen rent increase exemption program, and there is also the disabled rent increase exemption program. So you probably hear know them as SCRI, or you probably know it as DRE, right? So the senior citizen's rent increase exemption program are for seniors who live in a rent stabilized apartment, a rent control apartment, or a SRO, single room occupancy apartment unit and you are 62 years of age and you pay at least one third of your income in rent and that household income is $50,000 or less, right? So in saying that $50,000 number, you know, we keep in mind that there are certain deductions and those deductions that we do to consider. Oh, that's my, sorry. Good. Closer. Closer? Can everyone hear me now, clearly? Sorry about that, all right? Um, so, um, as I was saying, um, you have to be 62 years of age, also live in a rent stabilized or rent controlled unit, and as well as um, paying one third of your income in rent, all right? Um, with that being said now, right, uh, I was mentioning that the 50,000 number, we do allow certain deductions. Those deductions are taxes paid. Those taxes are federal, state, and local taxes, all right? We consider those deductions when we're doing the calculations in our office for the program, all right? The other program is the Disabled Rent Increase Exemption Programs. So for this program, you either need to be, um, you need to be disabled and receiving Social Security Disability, or you need to be receiving um, Social Security Income 
or as well as receiving veterans disability or you're receiving a postal or a railroad disability pension of sorts, right? If you fit on meet any of those categories, you can apply for the disabled uh, rent increase exemption program. And you don't need to be the main leaseholder as you would need to be for the senior citizen rent increase exemption program. You just need to be named on the lease in order to apply for that program, all right? And the income is the same, $50,000 uh, for the household and pay at least one third of your income in the rent. And um, that's that. Do we have any quick questions about the rent increase exemption program? I'm rent control. Uh-huh. But the only time I get a lease is if I have a lease with Um, it, sound, it sounds like something, I don't want to use the word legal, but uh, I'm doing these going on there. I would definitely go to the building management and discuss that with them because you want to lease. That's a contract that says you, you know, you're living there, all right? And, the, and if there's a concern there, I would also reach out to the rent guidelines board or um, depending on the development, HPD for uh, clarifications there, okay? Okay, so the, the, I can see this is going to be really deep, so we can speak out front at the table in, in regards to this and I can give you some avenues on where to travel, all right? Um, I'm actually going to follow Mr. Kellis's, uh, I would say, operation and take questions out there because I see that we're going to have quite a few as I did have a few out there while we were, um, while I was tabling. So I do want to, I do want to touch on one other thing here as well. So we do provide benefits for renters, right? But we also provide benefits for homeowners. So you might be familiar, or you might own a, own a shareholder, and you own shares in a co-op, you live in a co-op, it's your primary residency, or you might own a condo, or you might own a tax class one home, one to three family units. We do provide uh, benefits for homeowners, and uh, condo owners, and, and uh, co-op shareholders in regards to our exemption programs. That's the senior citizen homeowner's exemption, disabled homeowner's exemption. There's the basic star, there's the enhanced star. There's also the veteran's exemption, there's also the good Samaritan exemption, and there's also the clergy exemption. All these exemptions are primary residency based except for two. The, um, ex sorry, except for one, and that's the clergy exemption, all right? So if you want to discuss those more and find out some more additional details, I would say please visit me at the table and also pick up one of our flyers that disseminates a lot of that information on there in regards to the qualifications as well, all right? And I would uh, say even further to that is that this flyer, um, it shows upcoming events for the next six months here in Manhattan with, um, with the borough president. So if you need assistance applying for any program that the Department of Finance administers the homeowners or renters, I advise you to visit us uh, at one of these events where you can get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance with the Department of Finance staff member. We'll do everything there. It's a one-stop shop. Make the copies, fill out the applications, give you your copies, and take it back and process it um, at the office. And you know you receive your approval letter or whatever determination it may be. All right. So you can visit us at any one of these events. And if you want to find out where we are, you can also contact 311 and they will uh, give you a calendar of where to find us throughout the five parts. And folks have right. questions, you're at your table. Yep, I gave them that, uh, that uh, directive as well. So if you have further questions in regards to property or rental for the rent freeze program, please visit me at the table, okay? Thank you very much. Our next speaker is somebody that I see sometimes multiple times a day, other times once a week, other times once a month, but time does not go by before we are working together. She is a tough organizer for tenants. Uh, we are so lucky to have her in the city of New York, and she is fighting the fight every day supporting our tenants. If you can join me in welcoming Delsenia Glover of Tenant to Neighbors, we'll talk about uh, how you do. Everyone. Good. How's everybody doing? Good. Can you hear me in the back? 
So uh, I'm here to represent tenants and neighbors uh, and the Alliance for Tenant Power and the Statewide Housing Justice Coalition and the Rip Justice Coalition. Uh, tenants and Neighbors is an organization that started uh, back in 1974 and our mission is preservation of affordable housing and communities. Uh, we organize tenant associations and we organize tenants. We also counsel tenants on issues they may be having uh, in their apartments and we lead campaigns to strengthen the rent laws and we also support HUD housing. Uh, I'm really happy to be here this evening. Uh, we have a lot going on. Uh, I'm glad to see that there's so many rent regulated tenants here in the room uh, because rent stabilization and rent control is under siege. And I think that I was, I was at a meeting, this, at a hearing this morning at the New York City Rent Guidelines Board. But this is an example of how it's under siege. So, you all probably heard of a tax abatement program called 421A. And over the last four years, a lot of units have been built that are so-called affordable in these luxury buildings because that's what the that's what the landlord has to, the developer has to do in order to get the tax abatement. Well, I saw the statistic this morning. And I am here to tell you that the average rent for one of these so-called affordable, rent-regulated units is $3,300 a month. So they are building so-called affordable housing for people in the communities where we live who cannot afford the affordable housing. It's, it's ridiculous. And the reason why we're losing so many rent-regulated so rent, uh, units is because of the loopholes in the rent laws. So, uh, last summer, the Alliance for Tenant Power uh, started to reach out to organizations across the state because there are some areas, some corners of the state where they don't even have rent regulations, so people are really suffering, they're easily evicted, uh, there are housing issues, the homelessness crisis is, has escalated over the last eight years. Uh, I know a lot of people in this room probably like Governor Cuomo, but we blame him because he has not done very much, or he's done very little, if anything at all, to support tenants as far as getting the rent laws changed and closing the loophole, loopholes. Uh, the vacancy bonus is one of the drivers of escalating rents and why it's one of the issues that we've had on our platform for years now. Uh, next year coming up is a rent law year. For those of you who don't realize that, the rent laws were up for renewal in 2015, uh, the only fix that we got, uh, band-aid I should say, is that the threshold for deregulation went from $2,500 a month to $2,700 a month. And the, the uh, people who live in uh, apartments that have preferential rents, they, uh, they don't reach, if the rent reaches $2,700, um, they, it's, the rent doesn't, it doesn't go into luxury decontrol until that person moves out of the apartment. The preferential rent, are there any tenants in here with preferential rents? It's a scam. And the scam is that you, they, that tenants, uh, I live in a rent stabilized development up in Harlem called Lennox Terrace. And I talk to tenants every day who have pre preferential rents. I spoke to a tenant just last week he moved into his apartment seven years ago when the rent was $1,350. The rent now is, is uh, $1,750. His legal regulated rent is over $2,200. So anytime that the, so his rent has gone up $400 in seven years because the rent guidelines for increases do not apply to those tenants. And the reason why I call it a scam, it's a bait and switch because they get you in the apartment for a low rent you have a legal regulated rent, they say, oh, you don't have to worry about that. And the next thing you know, when your lease comes up for renewal, your rent is jacked up $200. And the reason why they do this is to make you move. And so that when you move, then there's something called a vacancy bonus. We call, we've renamed it the eviction bonus. When a tenant moves out of the rent regulated unit, they, the landlord can get a 20% increase just like that. They don't have to fix anything up. Just room sweep, they get, 20, they get a 20% vacancy bonus. Then they go in and, 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 and redo the apartment, put in marble kitchen counters and all sorts of things, and they get a percentage increase for that. So you can, the, the apartment could have been $1,000. Now 
now the apartment is $1,800. They let someone move in for $1,400, and voila, you have a preferential rent, and then you have to move out. So what I'm here to tell you about tonight is uh, we're very excited about this. We were in Albany just this past Tuesday, and we spoke to uh, Senator Kruger and some of the other senators because, you know, everything is about the Senate this year. Uh, we're hoping that, I don't, I'm not talking politics here, but we're hoping that things go well <laughs> and that when our bills pass through the Assembly, they don't get stuck in the Senate, in the Senate uh, with a governor who does not use his considerable power and influence to try to force some, some, force some legislation through that can help tenants. So we have come together with folks of like mind who believe in housing justice from across the state. And the reason why that's a, the reason why that is crucial is that they can put pressure on their senators and assembly members from upstate and downstate out east in Long Island so that the pressure is not coming from the city so uh, 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 housing justice is not just seen as a downstate or a New York City thing, it's seen as something from across the state and uh, it, builds, it builds pressure on elected officials but it also builds pressure on the governor. You know, folks in, in, in uh, our, our council member can tell you that elected officials, they respond to numbers. And so when we go up to Albany, or we do, we do a rally here in the city, what is impressive and what people, what we need to show people is that this is a massive movement for housing justice, not only in this city, but across the state. And I would love to see all of you people, when we put out the call, and uh, you know, your council member can help us distribute our information, we put out the call that you join us. Because as long as we, you know, meetings like this is a wonderful thing, but you have to be seen, you have to be heard by the people like the governor who can help to make a change uh, for rent stabilization. We are losing rent regulated units by the thousands every single year. And pretty soon they'll be all gone. Back in the back in the nineteen seven back in the nineteen eighties, actually, because I did a presentation about this, there were about four hundred and sixty thousand rent control units. Are there rent control folks in the room? Great. Well, you're having a rough time. As a matter of fact, as far as rent control, we have a rent control leadership committee at Tenants and Neighbors, and we did some town halls uh, uh, over the past year, you know, in anticipation of the MDR increases. And we actually had a few uh, septuagenarians and oct octogenarians get arrested on 41st Street in front of Governor Cuomo's office, and we spent some time in jail one afternoon to make a statement. Um, so what I'm here to tell you about, and I'm going to wrap up, is uh, our statewide, our upstate, downstate housing coalition. We're having a massive rally uh, on June the 14th on the steps of the public library. Uh, I think I have some flyers outside. If not, I will send a copy to uh, your council member and hopefully he can distribute it. But we expect to have about 500 people uh, on the steps of the public library as a show of force and tenant power to get something done in Albany that will save rent regulation and save the tenants uh, with preferential rents. So, with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, no questions? Yes, right here. Outside. Outside? Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, if you have something you want to talk about, you can, I'm out, I have business cards. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, the rally is at 5 p.m. on the steps of the library, uh, 5 p.m. on the steps of the New York Public Library on 41st Street. Uh, on June 14th. Be there, or as they used to say back in the day, or be square. <laughs> it's a Thursday. If you are rent control, if uh, you have been inspired to fight Albany along with our state senator and Elsenia, please step out of the room, uh, leave her at the table, and uh, work with us to change all we have. Because Lord knows we need all the help we can get. Uh, if you can. Now join me. Uh, we, we have a group called uh, Urban Justice Center. They have a project called CDP. 
and uh, we worked closely with them, and, and it was actually at the request of Urban Justice Center, which was then being, uh, this project was being led by Harvey Epstein, who you will hear from later tonight, and uh, they're here to talk to you about the Rent Guidelines Board. So, again, the Rent Regulated Tenants. So the Rent Regulated Tenants in the house, these folks are gonna tell you about why your rent kept going up for 15 years, even when the recession happened and uh, the, the uh, inflation was actually low, what was wrong, and uh, what we've done right recently, and how you can get active. And then uh, we'll come up after them as Kenny Schaefer at Met Council, who will work with you on getting your testimony ready, on getting what you need to do, what you need to say, so that folks can't unhear your words and they can't keep ignoring you. Uh, because at the end of the day, we all have to work for you. So please well, please join me in welcoming Eliana Garcia and Pilar de Jesus from the Urban Justice Center. Good evening. Um, I, my name is Eliana Garcia. I'm here with my colleague Pilar de Jesus. We are from the Urban Justice Center, the Community Development Project. Uh, every year, millions of tenants are forced to weigh if they're going to pay rent, if they're going to get their medicine, get food, their basic necessities. And we want to be, today I wanna, tonight I want to emphasize that there is a, a board who makes this, this decision and it's not just based on numbers. Your voice matters. and. Every year there is a series of hearings and meetings. They start in March and they go up until June, and that is when the final vote is made. In those uh, meetings, tenants have the right to uh, testify. They can submit either a written testimony or they can go up for two, three minutes and share their stories, their experience, their challenges uh, to the board. Uh, the adjustments are voted on and they're applied to leases uh, with effective dates between October 1st of that year and September 30th of the following year. The board is made up of nine members. There is a chair, two tenant reps, two landlord reps, and four public members. And they are provided with data and research every year um, and that is how they, they start off their, their proposals. For example, this year they might be proposing, they're proposing a 3%, 4% increase, um, but we're, we're, there's a Red Justice Coalition, which is made up of 30 organizations, um, community-based organizations in uh, New York City, and we encourage uh, tenants to testify and to not only to not to force the board not only to look at numbers but to really hear uh, the voices of the communities because we're not just numbers we actually carry these challenges and we represent um, the, what New York City uh, is and what we look like. And so just to add to everything Ileana mentioned, again it's a board and again they. It's a board that the mayor elects, so the mayor chooses who's going to sit here and they make the decision. Um, and so Mr. Kalos mentioned that, you know, in the prior years you received an increase and it was a recession. Well, that was due to the board and the lack of tenants coming out to testify. Not many tenants knew about the rent guidelines board or that these hearings existed. And so, you know, they were, landlords were the only ones showing up crying broke. And so, the, 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 that, and then because we had the Bloomberg administration, you know, that, that also caused like, well, the, ten, they, the landlords, they need 8% increase. So that was, was happening because there wasn't a lot of advocacy for tenants regarding, you know, to go to this hearing to let them know that, you know, no, they're, they're not broke. No, you can't afford it. Um, you know, we don't even have repairs because again, you you you're, the point is to come out and testify and let the board know what 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 they should be hearing because again, they look at a certain amount of data. What they don't get to look at is your preferential rent tenants. They don't look at MCIs. They don't look at vacancy bonus numbers. So again, like currently, the landlords are actually crying broke. I mean, they're always crying broke. And they're actually have been ahead of the game for the last quite like 12 years, and I think Kenny could talk better about it, but they've been profiting for a very long time 
on tenants. And so again, it's really, really, really important that the tenants come out. Hey, this is a former RGB member. He was a former tenant rep. Harvey Epstein, newly assembly member of the 74th district. Uh, my former mentor and our former boss. <laughs> Still my mentor, excuse me. Um, but yeah, Harvey was on that red guidelines board. Maybe you could add something about the red guidelines board. What were you saying? Something? Oh, okay, well, so uh, Harvey was one of our advocates on the rent guidelines board. So the tenant reps represent 2.5 million tenants. And so Harvey sat also with us on the Rent Justice Coalition, along with another tenant rep, Shayla Garcia. And we meet and we discuss to talk about what tenants want, because again, we're partners with all the community-based organizations. So they're on the grounds with the tenants, right? And so we know what the tenants want. And so we meet, well, Okay. When, when the RGB meets, we meet as a different coalition, but that's a separate conversation. But just know that there are nine members who determine what your rent increase is going to be every year. And we really encourage you to come out to make your testimonies. I'm going to read, I have these out front, but for Upper Manhattan, if you want to come out and let your voice heard, I think Caleb's hopefully is going to come out and testify. The Upper Manhattan Uptown public hearing is June 21st between 5 and 8 p.m. at 127 West 127th Street. I should have said this one first. There's also a downtown hearing, which is the day before, um, and that's from 4 to 8 p.m. for folks who are working and you know maybe cannot make uptown. That would be at um, Cooper Union, which is 7 East 7th Street on the 19th between 4 and 8 p.m. Well, let's give Pilar and Leon a big round of applause. I just wanted to come and thank everyone for being here and for to thank uh, uh, Councilman Kalos for sponsoring this again for the fourth time. Fourth time. Fourth or fifth. Fourth. It's whenever you ask me to start doing this. <laughs> um, so my name is Harvey Epstein. I'm the assembly member for the 74th Assembly District, which basically is the UN South. It goes into the Peter Cooper side of the town, East Village, Lower East Side. And I worked with the council member since he got elected. I think one of the first things he did was he came out to a rent justice coalition and he got involved in these issues. And these are critical issues for tenants. The issues of affordability and what the right guidelines were done is critical. So what Ileana and Pilar were saying was really critical. When I said on the uh, rent guidelines board, the testimony really impacted the members. The only reason we got a rent freeze for two years in a row for one-year leases is because thousands of tenants came out and told their stories. And they told what was going on, what was going on in New York, and they convinced the public members that what we were saying as tenant reps was true. They believed those stories. So it's critical that you do that. Even in our role as elected official, we know how important your voices are in this conversation. Your voices really matter. So I would encourage you to do that, to listen to what the, our friends at the Urban Justice Center, our friends at Tenants and Neighbors, the Met Council, I don't know if else was here, but our uh, Met Council, I've seen and Lennox Hill, basically, uh, you know, they are really the champions here. They've really been on this fight for decades. And we need you in this struggle so we can keep New York affordable, economically and racially diverse. If we don't have you, we can't win these struggles. So I want to thank uh, the council member for doing this, and I want to thank everyone for coming, and I don't know who we're turning it over to. <coughs> Actually, you can do that. I don't know if you know this person very I can bring up someone I've only known for a couple decades, maybe. Uh, just one or two, or a couple decades, let's say. Uh, but they're either of us are old enough for that. Uh, <laughs> exactly, I met him when he was in kindergarten. Uh, and I was younger than that, of course. <laughs> but Kenny Schaefer, who's been a legal services lawyer for my entire career, when I was a legal services lawyer, and has been a really strong advocate and has been a leader of that council on housing. So Kenny, can we let's invite you up and talk about the issues that we need to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Kenny Schaefer. I'm the chair of the Metropolitan Council on Housing. 
which is New York's oldest tenant rights organization. We're going to be celebrating our 60th anniversary next year, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. Um, and uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, if you're planning to testify, what points to make, how to conduct yourself. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, introduce my colleague, Laura Penaranda, um, make some remarks, and then I'll weigh in. And now, this is also a second point that Abby had uh, asked me to address on a different issue. We'll keep it all within 10 minutes so people can get the questions answered uh, inside and outside. Laura? Thanks, Kim. Um, so, my name is Laura Penaranda. I'm a community organizer with my council on housing. And um, I just want to speak to the cynics in the room um, who, you know, think, much like I do, that, that the RGB is, you know, at least partly uh, part of a political theater um, that potentially, you know, de Blasio has already made up his mind, he's already told the board members how to vote. Um, and I want to stress that as uh, has been mentioned previously. It's not the whole story, right? I mean, these uh, nine members are human beings that um, have pressures from above, but are um, open to hearing and being swayed by the narratives that they hear. Um, and again, this is coming from a cynic um, who, who um, wants to um, believe in the power of organized tenants. Um, so we've all we've heard from previous speakers that it's important to testify, and I just want to go through a few points of what a uh, effective testimony would look like. Um, and I want to recommend that people pick up one of these sheets. It's on the Met Council on Housing table. Um, it's a testimony guide. Uh, so if you find yourself wanting to testify but don't exactly know how to go about it. Please, this is an extremely helpful roadmap. You don't have to go point by point, um, but if you hit one or two points, then um, it'll drive home a powerful message. So usually, you know, you introduce yourselves, um, so I'll do it as if I were testifying here. Um, my name is Dara Peñaneta. I'm a member of my council on housing, or wherever, what, whatever your affiliation is, or I'm a resident of. Um, I'm a resident in Washington Heights, where I've lived for the past six years. Um, and I pay over 60% of my income on rent. So I am um, one of the over 50% uh, of rent stabilized tenants that are rent burdened, which means that we pay more than 30% of our um, incomes on rent. Uh, I work full time, I study part time, um, and this is critical. You tell them why even just 1% increase would make an impact on your lives. So I would say, if my rent went up, even just 1%, I would uh, have to fall back on uh, paying my student loans, or I would have to make different decisions about what I'm able to buy food-wise, um, because I can't, I already have, like, you know, I'm already rent-stabilized tenant, I'm not gonna, my rent isn't going to be lower, so I'm gonna have to cut costs elsewhere. And I'm living uh, paycheck to paycheck. I can't afford this. And driving that message home is, is what they need to hear. Um, and then I would choose maybe one or two additional topics. Um, for example, um, the net operating income, also known as NOI, grew by 4.4% uh, last year. This means that it's been the 12th year in a row that the net operating income has increased. And this is important because it means that landlords are not just making more money, they're making more money every year. Um, and that money isn't, it's going straight to, to their pockets. Um, it's not coming back in investments into my building. I have repairs that I really would want and demand to be made, um, but the money isn't making it back into the building. So whereas they're making money, my building is uh, deteriorating, and it's, it's not fair, it's not right. Uh, this is a contract, they're not keeping their end. Um, so I would close with a call to action, um, saying maybe that I am one of the 2.5 million rent-stabilized tenants that cannot afford increases, can't afford a 1% increase, can't afford a 2% increase. Um, 
He might, yeah. I mean, I, I want to roll back, but, um, yeah. but uh, definitely I can't afford more than 1% increase. Um, and this is why I'm asking you to vote for the lowest uh, increase possible. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just add a few points. Uh, one thing you should know when you're testifying is that you only have two minutes. It used to be three minutes. And I used to talk really, really fast and no one could hear anything I said. So you need to get everything down, figure out what you want to say ahead of time. You can prepare written testimony, and it can be as long as you want. It can include circles and arrows and photographs and charts. Um, they want you to bring ten copies, but if you only bring one, we can, we can take it and we can make sure one of the public members gets it and we'll spread it to all the other members. Um, so figure out what you want to say. Um, in terms of attitude, I think you want to be dignified, polite, but really angry. I mean, I'm really angry that rents are so high after so many decades of unjustified rent increases. And I think the points you want to make, in addition to talking about your own personal situation and the hardship that rent is for you, is that the rent stabilization law, which created the Rent Guidelines Board, if you read the, the findings and declaration of emergency, and we'll be giving out copies to remind people at the hearings and at the vote, is to protect tenants from unaffordable rents, not to protect landlords. And yet they do protect landlords too well. Um, they look at a lot of data, but most of it is irrelevant and confusing. There's really only two pieces of data they should look at. Every year they do an income and expense study of how the landlords are doing, and an income and affordability study of how the tenants are doing. They're both online. If you look at how the landlords are doing, what's new on the very first page, is that landlords' profits are up for the 12th straight year. And that's only new, because last year they were only up for 11 straight years. They're up to an astounding 41 point, landlords are making 41.7% profit of every rent dollar. For, what other business has a profit margin remotely like that? It's an outrage. And yet they come and they present testimony about how they're struggling. So one thing we should say is that they should have to testify under oath. Because they lie. They said that landlords would walk away from their buildings if they didn't get double digit increases. No landlord has walked away from a rent stabilized building since the laws were breaking in 1997. And then you look at the income and affordability study. Are they protecting tenants from unaffordable rents? No. Rent burden is at an all time high 36%. It used to be that 20% was a normal amount. In 1969, Senator Burke got the Burke Amendment passed where low income tenants would only pay 25% of their income. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected, he put Charles Erstat, anyone know that name, on his transition team. First, that said they could pay 25%, they could pay 30%. Now Trump wants to raise it to 35%. Even at 35%, more than half the city is paying unaffordable rents, while landlords are making 41% profit of every rent dollar. That's outrageous, and, and that's what I should you know, make sure you let those people hear. We can be outside and, and help you test, tell your testimony, testimony to your own situation. I just want to make one other point. I was asked to talk about uh, part of the upstate downstate coalition that Met Council is a leader in along with tenants and neighbors and a number of other groups, uh, is to have basically universal protection. Basically re-regulate all the deregulated units. There's been, according to the New York Times, it's only 150,000 units that were deregulated from their stabilization. And there's thousands and thousands of other units that aren't regulated. And we're trying to get a law that says no one in the state can be evicted without cause, and no one in the state can be forced to pay an unconscionable rent increase. Now, a very, very big sector, especially in this neighborhood, are people living in these deregulated units. But it's a constituency without a face. No one really knows who these people are. Paying $4,000 a month rent, people think, well, if they can pay that, they don't need help. That's $48,000 a year. Imagine a two-income household, people, two people make $36,000, it's not that much, $72,000 a year, paying two-thirds of their income for rent. They need protection. So that council tonight, we're announcing that we're going to help start organizing this faceless constituency with elected officials who have unregulated tenants in their district, put it in a newsletter, say that number one, your rent may be deregulated illegally. Uh, there's ways to challenge it, and if it's fraud, they can go back more than four years. So let everyone in that constituency know that maybe they were illegally deregulated, but if they were legally deregulated, they could be re-regulated. They had deregulation in the 70s, from 71 to 74. 400,000 units were deregulated. In 74, it created such a crisis that a decent legislature re-regulated those 400,000 apartments. And if we get a decent legislature in November, we're going to re-regulate all those units. So uh, that's all I want to say for tonight. So thank you.
thank everyone for participating in this evening's event. If you have questions, uh, specifically on writing your testimony, now is the time to ask. This is the one panel where you can ask lots of questions. I had one question, which is, you quoted a lot of numbers and statistics. Do I need numbers and statistics in my testimony, or can I just tell them that this is what my income is, this is what my rent is, and I just can't afford it? That's really, that's fine. That's what they need to do. Yes. Okay. Uh, if folks want to leave, you're free. If folks have questions and start, want to start working on their testimony tonight, uh, does anyone have any questions? I'll turn it over to Kenny to, to run this part. Yes. Hi. Um, my building was bought two years ago, changed ownership. There were 46 rent control, rent stabilized units. There are now 10. Can if I give you like the address and whatnot, can you get in touch with the the deregulated tenants in the building? They're they're young kids, a lot of them are from out of town. They're um they they were given a, like the bait and switch thing that you were talking about. Preferential rent when it came to their lease, the lease was raised way above. And they're all, they, they stay for a year and they move. And it's a constant churn. So, um, you know, right now, you know, we don't have the capacity to reach out to the 150,000 people. We want to get the word out. I, you. I say right now, we don't have the capacity to reach out. We don't have the capacity to reach out to the 150,000 people whose apartments are going to be regulated. We want to start getting the word out so they become aware. That's why I'm hoping that elected officials can put it in their newsletter that everybody gets. And through word of mouth, uh, there'll be uh, the word will spread that this this, this cohort is organizing itself. Um, they could be advised to contact their council, uh, and we'll you know we'll try to work with them, uh, or, or through the elected officials. We're just is there any flyer that you have prepared that we we could not post that I just, in a building? I just decided to announce this on the way over here tonight, but there'll be a flyer shortly, and we'll reach out to elected officials. Uh, that we help to partner with, as well as the other groups uh, fighting for universal protections. Uh, so if, if folks have questions, if you want to move up to the front of the room, the microphone battery we think just died. So just come up, we're going to do our best. Uh, and uh, yes, next question. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the use of questionable MCIs to pressure or stabilize tenants. Right. So uh, the question has to do with MCIs, which are called major capital improvements. Under the law, as it's been weakened by the state legislature, if the landlord makes something that qualifies as an improvement, they can raise your rent forever. Not just raise the rent until they recoup the money they spent, but raise it forever. And a lot of times, they do it legally, and the law allows it, and they get away with it. A lot of times, they do it illegally, and bill for things they're not entitled to, but the tenants don't challenge it, and they get away with it. A big problem here is the enforcement of the law by the New York State Division of Homes and Community Renewal. They're very passive. They accept landlords to do whatever they want. It's like, you know, a fire department, you know, just lots of fires burn until someone helps. So there needs to be much more aggressive enforcement by the state agency. So is there any organizing going on around that? Because, I mean, in our building we've had an unjustified, unauthorized repair for which they then apply the MCI reply, right. we so, right. so the there are two things. One is that the law allows them to get a lot of increases for certain things, and all we can do is try to change the law. We went, the we other went thing is that when landlords apply for things that they're not entitled to, that's something only the building can fight. Very often we they have done. to hire a lawyer, it's very expensive, and, um, and that's really all you can do. What I wondered is, are there many enough cases like this that perhaps there could be some joining together and bring some greater pressure on us? Well, not really, because every case has to be part of an individual. Is there another question? No. Ready? No. What, what is the definition of preferential treatment? Yeah. A definition of preferential treatment. Okay, it's a little complicated. Um, but basically, the landlord, you move into an apartment. It only starts when you first move into an apartment, usually. And the landlord says, the legal rent's up here, but I, I'm going to only charge you this much. And there could be various reasons why they do it, but it's all called preferential rent. One reason might be that you know the rent is risen so high for various increases, and that neighborhood they can't get that rent. 
so they just in good faith saying, well, I'll accept them while we're met. Now, sometimes that preference is that to last as long as you're in the, in the apartment. And other times, when the lease comes up for a year in a year, they can choose to end it. It all depends on how the lease is written, because the landlord's good clauses about the preferential rent, at least they're supposed to. If they don't, and if they don't register it, the preferential rent is not preserved. Sometimes the landlord makes up the whole number. That's totally illegal. The thing is, the tenant's not going to challenge it if they're paying the lower amount. Very often, the landlord, you know, they, when you move in, they look at your income, they know what you can afford. They try for something you can barely afford, and they'll raise the rent. $200 on renewal, you can't afford it, and you'll have to leave. And as Garcinia said, that means they're going to be able to get a vacancy uh, increase, or we call them a vacancy bonus. Um, so they call it preferential, but I said, I'll do it in a Yes? Well, you have to get a red history. You need to get a little technical. Uh, any tenant could go and get a red history um, from the State Division of Housing to the new I guess it's in the home state office building uh, up around the state of on 125th Street, and just walk it into your elected official's office. They have people there. If they can't see you then, they say, come back Thursday or whatever. Someone there, a call that council. There's a number of groups there that can help you for that. You can also uh, call our office. Uh, Abby, if I could get your attention for one second. Or see John. So uh, what do you call it? Contact our office, and we can work with you to go to the DHCR website. We'll go to the city, the state's uh, uh, we will go to the state agency website that's in charge of the rent histories. We will put your information in. We will print out the form that you need to submit for you. And you can stop by your, our office, sign it, and we'll mail it in for you. What if I've already done that? What's the next step? Okay. <laughs> if you've already filed a complaint. I filed a complaint. I have an index. Okay. And I'm challenging the landlord. But I, I got a certificate of occupancy, which differs from what the... Uh, Unfortunately, I think sometimes it takes up to two years for them to process these complaints. It's kind of outrageous. And again, we're making some changes in Albany. DHCR will start to do its job more effectively. Okay. But I think once you file it, it kind of stops. So, so share your index number uh, with our office, or we have Rebecca Graham from Rebecca Searight's office. Uh, where do you live in the neighborhood, if you don't mind sharing? East 81st Street. East 81st Street and? Okay. So we have Rebecca Graham. Uh, uh, she, so she's in the bathroom room. She's, she'll wait. We'll give you her information and you can share it. And they'll follow up on the index number. Uh, and our assembly member can help or the state senator Liz Brewer can help. And sometimes that gets an extra guy decision. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Trust me. Um, I live with my mother, who's been there for years, rent stable. I've been there for several years, so I so I have a voter registrator. I have everything, and I've checked with <coughs> apartments this session. Yeah. So, so I, session. I qualify. Right. So will I get the same rent as her? Yeah, three seconds or shoes, unless it's a second succession. So, so, yes. In other words, if she succeeded from someone else, which it doesn't sound like she did, but the second succession, they get a vacancy increase of about 20%. So I would be increased 20%? No, no, you're not the second succession, you're the first succession. Oh, but I see. But then if you pass uh -huh. it on to someone who's a uh, family okay. member or a de facto family member. I haven't done anything, but it's not necessary. Also, they renovated the whole building. They put a gym in, which laid dormant even though it's for everyone because of, I guess, liability, insurances, whatever. Now that it's finally just open, even though it's out there, ready to go, they won't let me use it because I'm not on the lease. I guess I can't fight that. I don't really know. I haven't dealt with that issue before. That, that's something you can bring to our office. We have a housing lawyer for our housing clinic. And uh, we'll work with you to try to get an answer. Now, the questions right now are supposed to be, what should be in my testimony before the rent guide oh, okay. so If you have specific questions about what's the rule for me in my specific instance, if you want to step outside, you don't have to share it with a bunch of new friends and neighbors you just made tonight. Uh, so who here just has questions about your rent guidelines board testimony? Well, uh, just one more question then. Is it, well, you, you, you can no, 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 answer no, questions my about- friend She's been so, in building 25 years. She takes the rent. Right so, rent right guidelines board, and, and, but you will still get yeah. answers to your question. I don't ask that. Yes, please. I want to know how um, in public housing in the future, you know, our rent is going up 35% also. 
I how do we ask out there? Um, how, how do we? I told her I would ask for her. Our uh, testimony. Are you in the Eisenhower or less? I'm actually the president of Douglas House. Okay, well, welcome. First, thank you. How are you? Great. Thank you for being here. Uh, are you entitled to community voices heard? Actually, I was on the board of community voices, so I just left the answer. They got to meet you. Too much? Yeah. Too much breath? Yeah, okay, so, so we're on camera, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll work with you to see how we can support you as a president and then we can work through you just through your town's association or whether or not is the CCOP of any support for you or... Yes. So we'll, I'll, I'll talk yeah, to you. Yeah, I work closely with Danny Barber. Okay. Um, I'm Carmen Quinones, by the way. I see. Right. Okay, so we'll talk about that offline. Anyone else have questions about Red Guidelines Board testimony? Okay, I want to thank Kenny for answering lots of questions that weren't just about that. Yes, please. Um, this is, if I want to hear you on radio, when can I hear you on radio? On the council's radio show? So, Met Council has a radio show every Monday on WBAI from 8 to 9. Um, I'm an occasional PM, it's an IPM, and also stream it at BAI. Look it up. I'm an occasional guest and an occasional host, but it's a weekly show. Uh, it's got some of Roger Pogauer, uh, regular hosts. I mean, so it's an entertaining uh, and interesting show. So WBAI, Mondays at 8 PM. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, on your way out, we're hoping you fill out an evaluation form. Let us know how we did, how we can improve this for next year. If you do, we'd like to give you a reusable bag. And I just want to thank you and all of our participants. Uh, and just to, to close, uh, I'd like to thank our state senator, Liz Kruger, our assembly member, Harvey Epstein, council member, Keith Powers, uh, Danielle Grant of Lennox Hill Neighborhood House, Stanley Isaacs, Marcel Dixon of the Department of Finance, Del Senio Glover, tenants and neighbors of Liana, uh, Garcia and Pilar de la Sousa at the Urban Justice Center, and of course, Kenny Schaefer from Met Council. If you can join me in saying. Yeah.